This is Anthony Pascal. And this is Lori Elster. And this is the All Access Star Trek podcast. Today on the pod, we have Terry Metalis, showrunner of Star Trek Picard Season 3. We're going to talk to him about a lot of cool stuff. But first, we're going to cover the news. And there's been a lot going on in Hollywood at the moment because the Writers Guild has gone on strike. It's the first strike since 2007. And that one lasted a few months and affected a lot of shows. And my personal hot take is give the writers what they want. They're asking for very reasonable things. Yeah. So you wrote this excellent breakdown on the website that really gets into the details of it and especially particularly how it could potentially impact all of our Star Trek shows. There's a bit of speculation in there because a lot of stuff isn't you know, public, but a writer's strike doesn't mean Hollywood is shutting down, even though like all the late night shows immediately shut down. Well, because they have to write everything every day. Yeah. (laughs) And the other thing is animated shows don't count because they have a different guild. So Lower Decks and Prodigy are unaffected completely. So work on those will continue. You know, other shows like the House of Dragon show, they're still shooting. Basically, if you have scripts, you can keep shooting. Or if you're a reality show. You know, you may see like actors and other people out there saying we support the strike and we, you know, we support the WGA and that's absolutely allowed. But actors are expected to show up to work if a production is happening. Right. They said if you want to join the picket line, then you can go when you're not working (laughs) and get on the picket line. The whole 2009 Star Trek movie was shot during the um, last strike. And that worked out fine, actually. But then the previous strike in 88 had a big impact on season two of TNG. Yeah. Probably the biggest question is about season three of Strange New Worlds. And some of that depends on how much has been written already, I would assume. Because they were going to go into production. I think they've, they're have they rethinking that. They can you know, start shooting what they have. But if the strike goes on, they'll run out of scripts. And the, the, I think the bigger issue is there's two more guilds that may go on strike. The Directors Guild and the Actors Guild's contracts come up at the end of June, and either one means immediate halt of all production. And that would impact animation, at least for the actors, not the directors, but the actors. Right. You know, no one knows what's going to happen right now in Hollywood. That would be kind of the Armageddon scenario if three guilds go on strike. No one's really expecting that, but it's not out of the realm of possibility. So it's kind of hard to plan around it. Right. And I would also assume they wouldn't want to start filming and then run out of scripts and have all their people and everything all assembled and ready to go and then not be able to keep going. Like economically, that probably doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, if you could film half a season, you know, because season they could do a hiatus, you know, it might be worth it, especially if there's schedules and stuff like that. Right. You know, the issue with schedules is probably a bigger issue with the Section 31 movie, which is set to shoot later this year. If they don't have a script they like for that, I can only assume that Michelle Yeoh can't be rescheduled easily. So there are, <laughs> no. you know, <laughs> I feel like every time I open my laptop and pull up anything, there's some new project of hers. The strike was no surprise to Hollywood. You know, the, the studios all knew this was coming pretty much. And so they did as much as they could to bank as many scripts as possible. But do they have a, a script that they feel is shootable for Section 31 now? I mean, they, they probably won't need to start shooting for six months. And the strikes probably won't go on that long, but, um, but there's budgeting and pre-production and planning. There's a lot of planning that goes into those things. Do you think that in terms of discovery, do you know the status of the discovery finale reshoots? I think that the plan was that just because it's easier that they would do the reshoot like the weeks before they'd start shooting strange new worlds because they share so much, not sets, but people, you know, so Because you don't want to hire a bunch of people to work for a week, you know, or two weeks. So I think those two projects are kind of linked. I can only imagine the script is done, whatever reshoots they're doing and new scenes they're doing because, you know, they knew this was coming. So that's, you know, that's the big question. You know, any strike that's longer than two months could impact 2024 in terms of that finale and Strange New World Season 3. The Academy show... 
was definitely shut down in that they're, you know, currently writing that show. And so the only work that could be done is stuff not related to writing on that show. Right. But it does kind of need to start with the scripts. <laughs> yeah. Now they weren't going to be shooting that show for, you know, till early 2024. So they got plenty of time on that one. One of the things is if you are a writer producer, which every writer kind of is these days, you can still work on a show as a producer. Um, you just can't write. It's got to be so tricky. Like, how does that affect? Like, if you're on set and you're filming a scene and they need a new line, are you allowed to come up with it? I no, don't think you no. are. You're not. Absolutely not. Absolutely yeah. not. But you are allowed to kind of explain the motivation or the backstory or why the Klingons right. are doing this or that. Now, there is one exception to that, which is ad libs are actually okay because that's just the actor. So the actor right. changes a line, but no member of the WGA can write a single word. Yeah. You know, and then there have been last minute rewrites. That's not uncommon. Now that could be done later in post. And so there's ways around this. I think the bottom line is it's not going to be a huge deal for Star Trek probably, but it could delay some things in 2024. Maybe. Right. But if the other guilds strike, then then they, it definitely will. You know, and we're going to get into this with Terry later. There actually there wasn't a thing happening for Legacy, but no development could happen in Hollywood. So you, writers aren't even allowed to pitch. Yeah, of course not. Yeah, but they can't even take a meeting to talk about a project. Right. I, you know, there's no real work going on on the Legacy show anyway because it's not really a, an official project. Right. And who knows what's happening with Star Trek Four? Apparently, there is a script I've heard. The, the issues that that project is having isn't over the script. It's, it's about getting schedules and you know other political issues with Paramount settled. <laughs> it's a messy business. <laughs> the, you know that's kind of the big news for the week, and it, maybe it's not news at all. Uh, I, do, I do expect the strike to last for at least a, a month, but you know maybe maybe by the time this podcast comes out, it's over. But I highly doubt it. Yeah, I don't think so. It doesn't sound like uh, there's a lot of willingness to negotiate. There is some merchandise news. Tell me about this game, because I don't know anything about it. And I'll be honest, I didn't read the article on our site yet about it. There's a game called Star Trek Resurgence. I think I've mentioned it before. I yeah. I did a demo of it when I was at Comic-Con last year. I met the guys writing it. Big Star Trek fans. And I'm excited about this game. It's a narrative game, so it's not all shooting. It's a puzzle solving and you have to make choices including moral choices and it impacts the game so it's it's and it's really a story it, it, it's like an interactive story and it's set in the post nemesis era like a year after nemesis and, the, and you play two different characters and you interact with some legacy characters so they announced that the game is coming on may 23rd and even though they've kind of announced nebula states before, this is kind of a fixed date. So they're finally, it's finally coming. And they revealed that Jonathan Frakes is voicing Riker. He's one of the legacy characters and they revealed an image of him. So that's exciting. And the, one of the reasons he's in it is because the, the Takan empire, if you remember that plays a part in the story and that's tied to the, fantastic tng episode uh the last outpost <laughs> <laughs> which i have not rewatched recently <laughs> and spock is in the game they have this guy who does a really good spock voicing it and there's probably some others that are you know and we'll have more coverage we're going to do review when this comes out on the you know around the 23rd it's going to be pc and console and it's just kind of exciting that there's a star trek game coming yeah, that's fun. There's uh, other merch coming as well. Patrick Stewart's memoir, which he talked about a while back, now has a cover, which looks great. Um, it's coming out October 3rd. Uh, you could pre-order it now. And he is doing, of course, he's going to read it. It said audio CD. It didn't say. I, I assume. It has to be down. Uh, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. There, there'll be an audible version and a download version. <laughs> it's it's surprising that there's a CD version. Um, they they also know, what's revealed. What's the CD? Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> they revealed the name of the book, and it's Making It So. Of course it yeah. is. <laughs> Making It So, a memoir. Yeah. So I will be pre-ordering that. Uh, well, I'm not an audiobook gal, but I might want to listen to some of it because he's reading it. Sounds well, fun. you could review it for TrekMovie.com. Oh, score. Done. There we go. 
I love a good memoir. You know, there's a few other things. We did a merchandise roundup. Um, probably the most notable thing is the Strange New World Season 1 soundtrack came out digitally. I'm not sure why it took this long, but it, it came out. And it's on all the, you know, Apple and Spotify and, and YouTube. You, yeah. Yeah. It's great soundtrack. The Picard Season 3 soundtrack actually came out a week before it. That shows you how long the wait for this Strange New World soundtrack has been. Right. Because Picard just ended and here's the soundtrack. And the first Prodigy Playmates figures are out. And hopefully we'll be doing a review of those as well. Oh, I hope so. So there's Gwyn, Dahl with Murph, Zero, and Jenkin Pog. They said Hologram Janeway is coming in May and you can already pre-order it. My girl Rock Talk does not have a figure yet. And the ship. There's no ship. So, I, re- I mean... I, I would love, I want the action figures. I want a plus rock talk, as I've said 7,000 times, and I want the ship. Well, hopefully this is, you know, just the first wave from Playmates, which is actually technically their second wave of new Star Trek, because they did, they did a wave of figures and toys last year. Right. Hopefully we'll get more and more from Playmates. Oh, there's also these uh, figures, these next generation figures from Super 7 that are all from the episode Elementary Dear Data. So there's Data as Holmes, Jordy as Watson, a Victorian Picard, and a Victorian Wharf. And they're 20 bucks each. Yeah, I, th- I forget. This might be their fifth wave. They've been doing these small TNG figures, and they're reasonably priced, and they're a lot of fun. They're also doing these kind of bigger figures. They announce a second wave. Those are f- exp- those are $55, which is a lot for a seven inch figure to be perfectly honest. Yeah. Um, they got a ton of accessories, um, but yeah. So it's kind of a good time to, you know, and EXO is doing the crazy expensive $200 figure. So if you, there's a whole, you could get Star Trek figures from 20 bucks to 200 bucks and there's new ones coming out. So it's kind of exciting. Yeah. They're doing, um, they have Ensign Harry Kim and then they also have figures from Picard season three. So Admiral Picard, Worf and Vatic. Vatic will come with a cigarette, I assume. I wonder if this is Amanda Plummer's first action figure. Probably. So she must be excited about that. Yeah, I can imagine. I bet that's fun. So this last thing we're going to talk about, it's not a product. It's a project called the Roddenberry Archive. And so Roddenberry Entertainment has been working with this tech company to kind of digitize everything that Gene Roddenberry did. And they're starting with all of the Starship Enterprises. So this actually goes beyond, you know, the work that Roddenberry did directly. And they released this new interactive portal website where you can visit all the bridges of all the enterprises and not just the ones, you know, like obscure enterprises and and refits of the different bridges. So there's like over a dozen bridges, including the Enterprise G from the new Star Trek Picard. And they're going to be adding even more of them, like obscure ones like the Yesterday's Enterprise Bridge and stuff like that. I was going to ask about that one. I haven't even had time to to poke around and really look at it yet. Like I want to set aside some time and go exploring. It's all laid out on a timeline and there's all sorts of stuff you could do. Um, And it's all free. So, you know, and they've got all these great behind the scenes people working on it. They also released at the same time this video that's hard to explain, but basically it's a video showing Spock and they have this actor who, so it's not digital actually, it's a guy, looks just like Nimoy, but only because of this prosthetic that he's wearing. And he's visiting Kirk's grave and then they show the saucer of the Enterprise D being kind of recovered. You know, And it's just a fun little video they made for no reason they just thought it'd be fun to make it so well that does sound fun so <laughs> it, yeah no, it's very yeah. cool yeah they have another video with delancey so that it's they're spending a lot of money on this thing even though it's completely free that's nice for a change yeah so rod roddenberry is giving something back to the fans i think that's great yeah i gotta appreciate that yeah um, and then a couple more things on the site. We just we did an analysis of the Strange New Worlds teaser trailer that really digs into it and slows things down and looks at them close up. So a lot more details than we talked about last week, for sure. Yeah, you could see a bit from Una's trial and Rigel 7 and, you know, there's little stuff in there. I think that's it. So I think we should just move on to talk to Mr. Terry Metalis. Let's do it. Welcome, Terry Metalis. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Thanks thank for you. joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be here. 
we I have to start just by saying thank you. Like I can't think of any better expression than thank you for that glorious season that had me jumping up and down on the couch and crying and yelling and scaring the crap out of my family while I reacted to it. <laughs> thank you for all of that. You are very you are very sweet. You you are welcome, but thank you for watching it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your for, for sticking with it. Oh, and we watched every episode multiple times, let me tell you. <laughs> multiple times. Wow. Well, for, for the podcast. Oh, that's right. You yeah. got to do your research. But, you know, Lori's feedback there, she's obviously not alone. I agree with her. But, I mean, how does it feel? I mean, you've been gauging the feedback yourself, you know, now after you've gone through this. Because I know you were kind of nervous before the season. So, you know, are you? do you feel like you've accomplished what you set out to accomplish? How do you feel about the feedback you've got? You know, I, I feel really good now. Once it was over, certainly the, the the fans have been overwhelming for sure. The vast vast majority. I mean, obviously, there's criticism, valid, not so valid, um, and you listen to as much of it as, as you can take. But peer validation, I, I, I received a lot of industry calls from some people. Uh, that I highly, highly respect some heroes of mine that I got to sit down with. And that was, uh, that was overwhelmingly um, rejuvenating in every way creatively of, Hey, maybe we, maybe we did something here. So that was really something because you want to stay, well, maybe you don't want to stay humble, but, but, but Twitter sure makes you, makes you as humble as you could possibly be. Um, (laughs) And, but yeah, I mean, it, I tell you what does feel good is not having, um, having it out there. I, I don't, there's no spoilers to protect. There's no, there's no Borg and changeling conspiracy to worry about uh, leaking. Um, there's no having to sort of uh, watch the fan theories uh, as to who's going to be upset that there's no paw wraiths coming or <laughs> who has seen um, uh, a locutus DNA being passed on that that's this, that's gratifying is it's out there. Um, the other thing that's interesting is, you know, Frakes and, and Stashwick called me cause they were in Calgary doing um, a convention and they're like the fan reaction is overwhelming and, but he goes, but there's a, quite a few of them who are waiting to binge it, who have just been waiting for it, which is fascinating because I don't know how they've avoided images of the Enterprise D, the Borg. And I guess for those folks, they don't care that those spoilers help them um, uh, decide if they want to watch. So there, there's an audience yet to come, which is really interesting. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel pretty good, I think. <laughs> We've seen some famous people i mean on social primarily like josh gad and bill prady and people like that just singing the praises of the season anyone else that you can tell us about uh there are there are some but i can't i can't say their names but yes there are some pretty seismic fans that (laughs) i have sat with that are um that have been very 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 flattering so at you know at bare minimum, this has been a big jump for your potential future career. Well, I don't, I, maybe, I don't know, but um, it's certainly flattering at, at the most. I mean, it's, it's a kind of creative validation when, when there are folks who you want to fawn over creatively and, and they're like, no, 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 just stop. I I, I want to, I want to talk to you about how you did like, and you're like, wow. Um, you know, um, I sat I sat down with a lot of my writers and I was like, boy, I wish you could have been at this meeting so that you could have experienced this because they all deserve it because it was such a collaborative effort. But it was very, very difficult in the time constraints that we had um, and, and the production um, limitations that we had to do was we were super ambitious. We, we wanted it to be a giant next gen movie. And uh, so that required us working really, really hard. And, uh, you know, I think for most of us, we're, we're really, really proud of the results now that we can see it on screen and, and have the reaction. But, um, you know, it was not easy. Um, but I think we're all feeling really good. 
What's what's been the feedback from you know Alex Kurtzman and internal folks? I, I think the the same. I think everybody uh, everybody certainly is feeling the uh, success of it all, and and looking back at okay, let's look at what really worked uh, about it. You know what what are fans responding to? I mean, everybody from from Alex to Patrick. You know, certainly the the rest of the cast. You know, I just did the DVD. Um, commentaries uh, a few days ago with uh, with Frakes and Brent and Lavar and, and you know now it's now we're just pals talking about it and it's 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 a blast and boy we would love to keep going and do more of that. That has to be kind of surreal for you as such a, as a fan as well. Yeah, it, it has actually stopped being surreal. So it goes for it goes from wow I'm I'm a fan. And then it goes to being surreal. And then it, now it's just not a thing anymore. I just like them. <laughs> I just <laughs> want um, and it, uh, to, to just, oh, hey, I, I, I forgot. I got to call Johnny and um, who just had a move and ask him about an internet thing. Like, so it, 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 it's, it, it just, you know, they're, they're just people. We're all just people. LaVar's daughter, Mika is a friend of mine and, the screening the other day so it's it, it's so it's just you just turn into people <laughs> so. you you said that there's been a lot of talk about the you know what worked and different so are what is the consensus internally or from your what you've seen on social of what you think worked what are kind of the key takeaways that you possibly would you know carry forward to future projects i think there is a um, an aspect of how these characters changed a kind of reinvention of them, but still stayed the same that, uh, that worked. There is a, both a celebration and a criticism of nostalgia, which is a really interesting war that you see, um, out there amongst the fans. There's a, there's a, there's a celebration of it in the most romantic way. And then there's a cynical, um, hatred of it uh, 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 in another aspect of it. And so there is a, certainly a balance of it. I think in this season, I don't know that an Andor approach would have, would have worked w- with this cast. I mean, when you're at the end, it's very difficult not to, not to look at the beginning. You know, when you sit down, even with this cast, um, specifically with Patrick and, and Frakes and LaVar, they will predominantly talk about the past and how it's influenced where they are now. And so that kind of dictates in a lot of ways, how characters are uh, at a certain period in their lives um, and, and how life and, and your stories uh, require you to look backwards in ways. So, so there, 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 I think that that actually worked in, in a lot of ways um, going forward. Again, you know, the last 10 minutes very much are the passing of the torch, right? The, the, the next generation. I think there's probably uh, a lot less of that, but still history is history, right? Like if you were going to move forward in the 25th century, you are looking at, well, how has the um, Rick Berman universe changed? How has the Klingon Empire changed? How does Worf and Alexander fit into that paradigm? The Jemadar, Kira, Quark, you know, those kinds of things I, I think are really interesting. So I'm not sure that's every episode. I think you want to meet new alien worlds and, and new species as well and new political dynamics. Uh, so I think that's all important too. It's a roundabout way of answering your question. <laughs> I know it's leading me to 50 other questions that, <laughs> that we need to cover. Um, <laughs> um, well, let's start with, I guess, the, the the character evolution that you were talking about, looking at the past and then looking to the future of these characters. Like, did you have your own backstory for what each of them been, had been doing for the last 20 years? And did any of that change once you started talking to the actors about it? Um not really changed um was developed in collaboration with 
you know, specifically Worf, you know, uh, when we sat down with Michael, he, he very much didn't want to leave off in any of the, we talked about all the, all the canon backstories of where he was as a, as a captain um, in, 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 and in Starfleet. And he didn't want to pick up on any of those threads certainly was in the, in the kind of journeyman samurai world was, was definitely influenced. And we also saw that imagery as well. Jordy was exactly where we saw him and LeVar saw him as well. Gates didn't really, uh, was open to all of it. Didn't really have necessarily, uh, an idea as to where Beverly was and was beyond intrigued as to not being a doctor in Starfleet, not being the expected admiral at Starfleet medical and, you know, the captain of the USS Pasteur or any of those things. Um, and, and being some somewhere entirely unexpected. She loved that. I know Michael Chabon in season one, he would write these elaborate backstories out as a kind of show Bible things that we never saw on screen to just kind of, help with himself and maybe with some of the actors. Did you, did you do any of that kind of stuff? Well, Michael's a genius <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and love and would, would love to stay up until um, 4am to be able to do that. Um, we didn't have to do that too much necessarily. I'm trying to think of, we did a little bit of that for Jordy. We did um, some of that for the criminal empire stuff with the Vlashi crime syndicate with the Vulcan uh, with Sneed, that whole sort of world we spent some time developing probably not in the novella fashion that Michael could so brilliantly do <laughs> um, but certainly um, quite a bit of it there was Daystrom Institute the 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 day uh, the, uh, the offsite Daystrom lab was you know how how they uh, worked how they were part of Starfleet intelligence and and where they fit in with with the uh, Section Thirty One, and what level of nefarious uh, um, clandestine operations they were actually a part of, was quite a bit of debate. But at some point, you don't have time to sit there in a room and debate that anymore. You 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 have to feed production, and the producers are literally knocking on your door, being like, you know, we got we have to build something, guys. Can you stop <laughs> talking about Section Thirty One for a moment and how that fits into the uh, your your the last two seasons of Deep Space Nine? So, so since, you, go ahead. I was going to ask about Section the Section Thirty One. Same. Oh, well, so, no, please same, don't. Well, <laughs> I, what we want to know if you're up to it is sort of how you see it, because obviously it's been interpreted different ways by different writers and creatives behind the scenes creatives and it's lately been something that has like new interest i mean i never thought that all these new shows and it's a bunch of them would be that interested in it so i'm i'd love to know how you see it and what its role is in the federation and why you think it sparked so much interest with everybody well i think it has to remain nebulous right i think the second you define it i, I can't speak for 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 discovery or the or or the I, I I don't actually know the plot of the the new Michelle Yo uh, piece, but I think certainly in the in the Deep Space Nine era, you know, you start to look at uh, the Iraqi War, you start to look at uh, Blackwater, and you start to ask how much this is Starfleet aware of what they did. And you, you you argue, well, they they weren't aware, but they kind of had to be aware um, of, of what they did. And there's no, uh, and how much you know, Bashir seemed to 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 have a certain knowledge of it. The second you, and we never intended to answer any of those those questions, but it it, it certainly feels like. They are some kind of private um, entity that seems to receive some kind of funding from Starfleet. And at some point were considered a critical division uh, during the Dominion War. Um, they work independently of Starfleet intelligence, but somebody's scratching somebody's back clearly. 
And I think it's, you know, again, and I think the, the real hot button debate is how Star Trek is this? How, how does this feel like a piece of Roddenberry's universe? And look, I, you know, that's a great question for Star Trek fans to answer. I think it existed. I think it's a, I think it is a part of, of Deep Space Nine. We, we didn't want to, uh, we certainly didn't have the time to investigate a whole episode into the affairs of Section 31, but we definitely, when you're dealing with changelings and how they would feel after the Dominion War, after that virus, you would have a certain point of view. I, I would ask, I would ask you as fans, how do you feel about how Section Thirty One Post Dominion War acts? Where where's where where's your opinion as to where they exist or don't exist within Starfleet? Well, I mean, I always liked the idea of a nefarious dark group that was working, say, on behalf of the Federation, but outside of the Federation's control. And so that's kind of one of the th- like, for example. The scientist who was torturing the changelings was working at Daystrom Station, right? Right. And she was Section 31, which means Section 31 had a section of Daystrom officially. Right. Officially or unofficially? Again, well, I, like, I, I, that, that's the question for me. Right. Is could could the I've always said like could the you know head of Starfleet Intelligence or the president of the Federation say get me the head of section 31 on the phone right now i want to talk to him were they part of the chain of command or not right but isn't that but then you're arguing what's plausible deniability for the president of the united states right for like i don't know what happens at area 51 right and i'm not talking about aliens or or anything or or i'm talking about a cia black site At, at some point even the american government or any government or any intelligence agency has some kind of level of plausible deniability when they want to do icky stuff there's no question governments do icky stuff and have have ways to do it i mean everything post 911 tells you everything about it from zero dark 30 on like i mean that you know so i think <laughs> but it's not really it's not really the story we set out to tell. It feels like Deep Space Nine already paved those roads. But you were trying to, I mean, I mean and there was all, you know, all the stuff about the sympathy for Vatic. Mm-hmm. What I guess one of the questions is, were we supposed to feel like, yeah, the Federation made mistakes and she, we understand where she's coming from and people should pay the, because the thing is, were there any consequences? Should there be consequences? Who made those mistakes? And did Vatic deserve to get what she got, but no one else deserved any other consequences for inciting that? I think it's an excellent question, right? It's becomes, she says the Federation took my family. Well, did the Feder, you know, from her point of view, it's the Federation, but is it the Federation exactly the Federation? Is it some part of Starfleet? Do the American citizens deserve to pay for torture crimes of uh, uh, during post 9-11? Probably for supporting. I mean, I, I mean, it's, it's a terrible argument for supporting the Bush era. Like, I, you know what I mean? It, it becomes supremely complicated. Again, it's not, you know, these are, these are the debates you have in a writer's room for as long as you can before you got to move on and tell your story. But I guess that's the question of, is that part of your story? Are, are you making it, is there a social allegory? Is there a contemporary message? It's definitely a post-war story, for, for sure. It's definitely about the crimes of, of war. It's definitely, and again, it's definitely a continuation of that story that already existed within deep space nine, that virus existed. The, um, those nefarious deeds um, were a part of that storyline. And we wanted to touch upon that and have Vatic have a, a really distinct point of view. And it also was, it seemed to us like the kind of thing that an intelligence agency would want, which is the perfect spies. Changelings. 
It's a tough one for me, I'll admit, the whole Section 31. I mean, it was from the minute it was introduced, because I always loved the idealism of we're past that. So I get the struggle there, because for me, I think, no, they should not have a group like that at all. And it doesn't, to me, it's not a great fit. It's realistic in terms of what happens with people in the world and governments. But it's a tough fit with Star Trek. Right. But again, it's not all Star Trek. I, you know what I mean? I don't think it negates the idealism of Star Trek to talk about a, to, to zero in and zoom in on one tiny pocket of, of, of the canon for an episode. You I know, think I it's don't... because it's Starfleet. That's where I get into. But is it Starfleet or is it a tiny part of Starfleet? I mean, it, you know, it is a part of an intelligence agency. That's an off. Like Starfleet would be so vast. Like we don't talk about every single department within that giant military operation or its funding. I mean, it's huge. I mean, how many ships are out there? How many operational, like, it would be massive. So to say that that peacekeeping corporation had, like, and again, we're talking about it not officially being part of Starfleet. That's the question, because Worf would describe it as basically part of Starfleet intelligence. Anyway, but, we, you know, we, we're way down a rabbit hole. But yeah. th this kind <laughs> of t ties into a, a separate thing, which is Vatic talked about it and, 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 uh, Picard said, I, I didn't know. And that brought up kind of a bigger issue of before the season came out, it, it almost felt like, oh, Vatic must have a, a con like thing against um, Picard. But it was more revealed that it was really she didn't really know Picard and, and had no connection to him. And he had no connection to this program, the Phoenix. What was it called? The whatever the program was where she Proteus. was Proteus. Was there any consideration to make a closer connection between them and 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 more to the point of we still don't know, like what was the U.S. Enterprise and Picard doing during the Dominion War? You kind of still left that a blank slate. Obviously, they, they had to have been part of the war. Right. I mean, there's no way the Enterprise wasn't a part of it. We did actually, and there's no way I'm going to get into it right now with uh, with the fans, <laughs> especially with we did have a more personal connection to um, Project Proteus and Picard that we debated. But um, we ultimately decided not to go there. I think it, it would have been very interesting that there were. Again, I'm here. I am like ready to pitch it to you. I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> and it, it, it was really. It would have been wildly interesting uh, um, to, to go there, but it would require a lot more time to to pull off. I'm intrigued. <laughs> I want to know what it was. <laughs> you would it, it would have been like an entire next gen episode that that we would not have been able would not have been prepared to do, uh, but it would have been fascinating. There is a lot of things are happening in this season that there, there's characters that are doing things that we never see. Um, and there's kind of mentions of things in the past. One of, you know, like a, a jokey one is your joke about the enterprise E like, so what, you know, did, did you, when you did that, you guys, you didn't really have an answer to that, but you thought maybe someday someone will do a comic book. I mean, well, we had an answer. It's just that, do you want to hear that in the shuttle? Uh, you know, is that good scene work? Well, we can't use the Enterprise E because Worf and the blah, 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 blah. You know, that's not going to be good in the scene. As opposed to, and obviously we can't use the Enterprise E and they just look at him and that's not my fault. Is one, a way better joke. And two, keeps it open to fan interpretation and then gives somebody an incredible opportunity down the line to tell a better story. Or a terrible bit of exposition in a shuttle that should, shuttle scene that should be emotional and about that moment. It's interesting. Janeway was a big character this season. She right. kept on coming up. She was part of the motivation behind. Well, of course, who else is seven? In the same way that Admiral Nagora was would be brought up a bunch in you know the original series. You 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 want to give a name to to why not? The fans would certainly say why not reach out to Janeway. Both Picard and Seven have a personal relationship with Janeway. We were also hoping in the process of writing this that that might be a payoff for us that we could pull off, but we weren't, we were not able to for 
for a variety of reasons. So the, 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 the Tuvok scenes would have been Janeway scenes is what you're saying. Uh, no, no, we, not the two we would have, or in addition to, I would say. Okay. And then in your head canon, was Janeway maybe kidnapped and replaced by a changeling? And that's why the frontier day plans went the way that they did. I can't, I can't speak to the plots <laughs> that we, we I, but that we had we had a, a, a couple of really nice moments that would have been really really cool. It's 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 just how it goes, you know. It's the, you you try uh, you aim for the best, you know. Uh, we're we're happy with what how it all turned out, but um, you know, also if you're going to do Janeway again, you want Janeway to to have her own great big story and prodigy is shining a wonderful light on her in their own way. You don't want to step on prodigy's toes either. So yeah. Yeah. I just mean sort of within the, the fiction of it all in terms of understanding. I think Janeway probably has a pretty amazing story dealing with the chain way, the changelings all on her own. Yes. We, we don't certainly don't want to feel like, I mean, cause the, it, the, Frontier Day was so obviously a stupid trap that anyone who fell for it, <laughs> we just kind of like, how could you possibly have now, you know, changeling infiltration answers that question. But some people like Shelby went along with it and you're like, dude, you know, as Riker and Picard point yeah. out. So we're kind of hoping that Janeway didn't go, f- didn't fall for it as well, I guess is what we're saying. I think there were lots of people who were objecting to it i take umbrage with your word stupid trap um but uh (laughs) the i think that the if you have enough changelings on the inside uh the you can you can manufacture an event that's big enough to to manipulate that okay all right fair enough (laughs) another character that's an off-screen character is odo did anyone ever suggest like we could have him call in, like have a voice guy come in or fake CGI no, voice? I don't, or... I don't think that would have been good. Worf could have I, cut off his arm, and then there would have been. Oh, oh no, that wouldn't yeah, really. Work. I don't. I don't. Yeah, I, I think. I think that might have been a little. I don't think that would have been particularly good to to do that to Renee. Well, so. It's, I mean, I agree with you 100%, by the way, so thank you. Um, <laughs> but into, this sort of brings up the whole issue of the expression fan service, which is something, you know, before, honest, I'll be honest, like I was super worried about that in before season three started, and I still will get, you know, my, my back gets up and when I see it in some places, and yet in Picard, I think it worked beautifully and was I loved I soaked it all up I was like greedy for more it was great how do you figure out what that balance is and do you think that it exists that there could be too much or what where do you see all that well I think we feel like what we put in was right clearly there are there's are some that feel like it was too much you don't really care what they think um I think the crowd has certainly responded a certain way I think um I think if it was just shameless fan service, we would have just opened up with them all reunited on the Enterprise D and that's it. Like we didn't, that it was to imply that it's just a bunch of member berries is it, you just, you could just do it. There's no storytelling involved in it at all. Um, there's, there's a kind of um, viewpoint that all that was un, unearned that, that going to the fleet museum is just an, uh, is, is shameless. Sure. Okay. Not for us, not for, I think a a, a large swath of the fans would think that that place actually exists and would, and could actually serve a really interesting, um, uh, place of reflection to Star Trek, to the story, to these characters and, uh, serve as an interesting plot point. So, uh, look, it just comes at, look, if you're a hammer looking for a nail, which are some people and some critics, yeah, there you go. There it is. Fan service, nostalgia, kill it, kill it. For others, it, it worked quite a bit. So we feel pretty good about it. If there were a follow-up show, do you feel like 
this is the right level or it would be toned down because that's more about a new crew and a new thing. I think we told the story of the next gen cast coming back together. And I think that dictated certain things. I do believe though, that you're living in the 25th century. You're coming. What are we on the 56th anniversary of star Trek now? 57. You live in a universe that's been around for 57 years. And I say this often, if you go into somebody's house and they've lived there for 57 years, they have pictures on the walls, they have furniture they've had, there's music that they play. You're going to run into things. It's odd if they don't. If they live in an entirely modern stark house, there's something wrong with them. They've lived there for 57 years. So there are things and you'd want to run into things, I would think. But I can't really say because there isn't a follow up at the moment as to what exactly we would do. Was there anything that was over the limit? Was there any kind of like, I want to do this character or visit this planet or what, something that you really wanted to do, but you couldn't find a reason to fit it in story wise? We never really I think Moriarty was probably the most egregious thing that that I, I was like, I just want Moriarty. But it that was that fit into data's memory uh, as a projection. Everything else was, we need a thing here for this. And it could be that, you know, going into data's head and lore, there were moments that seemed obvious to us. I would say, um, yeah. I mean, when you have an opportunity to be like, you know, for instance, the Federation president in the finale, it's, well, who could that be? We could go try and get Brian Cranston. No problem. Okay, that's cool. I got Brian Cranston. He's an old friend of mine. All right. That's kind of interesting. Who else could we get? Todd Sastrick says, you know who's my neighbor? Walter Koenig. Oh, shit. God, wouldn't it be interesting if we heard Walter Koenig play his son? You sit around for a second and you're like, kind of gives you chills for a moment. And, and you're like, well, let's play with that for a moment. And that's way better and way more interesting and has way more an impact to to uh, when we were in the IMAX screening there were audible gasps when he started talking and to me that's worth it and you know what and I and I want to honor Walter Koenig I want to like he deserves it so that's where we go I loved the way that you brought back Ro. I thought all those scenes were really amazing with Michelle Forbes. So we had Ro, we had Shelby. Like, were there other characters that you really very seriously considered putting in there and then just didn't, couldn't do it for story reasons or other reasons? We did have an episode with Naomi Wildman. Oh. That uh, it just didn't have, it, it did, it, 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 we just couldn't make it work. Um, but it was, it was, uh, boy, it, you know, if you ever go and do another one, you would totally do this story. You basically went to the Fenris Ranger equivalent of Tortuga. Um, we went there for help and met Naomi Wildman, who had followed in Seven of Nine's footsteps and became a Fenris Ranger, but was a much harder version of a Fenris Ranger than Seven was. Wow. But ultimately what it meant was a production. We would, we would not have been able to pull it off, but the set we would need to pull off to do space Tortuga. <laughs> and it even, it even uh, reached out to Scarlett Palmer's or I believe it was yeah. right uh, to, 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 to try and get a zoom to see it. Um, but Ultimately, uh, it was, you know, we wanted to get the Geordie. We needed to do all those things. So it was, it was, it wasn't the right thing, but we, yeah, there was a fully explored story. Was she interested in that? Would she have considered it? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. I, I imagine with all the section 31 and the dominion stuff that at least characters like Bashir and Kira were considered at some point as well. Absolutely. Again, but you, if you do any one of those characters, you you don't want to give them two scenes. You want to do that right in the way that we did Michelle Forbes. And and Michelle Forbes, bro, is a next-gen character, and this was a next-gen reunion, right? So, uh, again, if you had 13 episodes, without question, you would, one of those episodes would, would be Bashir. One of those episodes would be Kira. But we didn't, we didn't have that. 
how dead is Ro and Shelby and everyone else we think are dead? Um, currently, <laughs> uh, in look, I it's we we left it o- open, you know, both both characters were open. I mean, certainly you want to feel the stakes of both of those things. Uh, you know, I, I, we we intended to to see Ro again. Um, she was in the original finale script and um, production was like, we can't don't have time to shoot these scenes. There's no way um, it would have required uh, a build of uh, on these uh, intrepid sets and extras and, and things. And we just didn't, we did not have time. We could not do it. I had this fantasy that in the final episode, someone was just going to open a room and it would be filled with all the people who had been replaced and we'd recognize all of them. <laughs> that was, that was actually the scene or, or, or most of them. Um, and there was quite a few and, and Tuvok was there and, and Ro and others. And yeah, it was- I mean, obviously there wasn't, and I mean, even separate from costs, it seems like there wasn't time to even like open up more stories because we, it was hard to fit in I think some of the stuff you had like like Rafi and Jean-Luc I kept thinking about have this relationship that we didn't get to see in the in season three that had been built up in the past two seasons yeah. I mean were there other things that you wanted that you would have done more of well of had- course but you brought on the entire next gen cast right? right so that you had not seen in 20 years that's the other thing is why was there not more of this why was there more of that well you know there is it is an ensemble and we could own, we could service what we could service and not, and it's, it, it was what it was. And how challenging was it for you when you had to, like, there are elements, I mean, the third season's so different. And then there were elements of seasons one and two that sort of had to be, that had to still fit in, even if that wasn't what it was about. So how hard was that for you in terms of like, just simple, like, it's you know, Data's death, Q's death, the Borg, like all of that. How did you wrap your head around telling the story you wanted to tell without negating the things that had come before? It wasn't too challenging. I think, I, I think we thought in our minds that the Gerardi Borg being this other subsect of the Borg was going to be more obvious to fans and clearer. Um, we, we weren't. Um, you know, by the time we finished shooting season three, season two hadn't even aired because we, we had sort of split off in the last few months. And we had talked about there was another scene at the end of season two that we had assumed was going to be didn't get cut um, <laughs> that explained it a lot more. There was a there was a, a scene with um, an admiral and Picard and Girardi in which it was clearly laid out that the Borg Gerardi had stayed out of history's way. Did she had not replaced Wolf you know, three, five, nine. It still happened, you know, and had not replaced that, the Borg uh, and that she was guarding this one section. And so we were, we were caught a little bit unaware that, that, that was not as clear, I think ultimately, because we were, we were on season three. So that's probably the most difficult thing. I think the, the most difficult carryover that the real Borg, uh, the the Voyager Endgame Borg, were out there. It, speaking of them, to be clear, the finale sets up that this was the last Queen, that was the last Cube, those were the last drones. Yeah, this is this is it. That that this is essentially the end of the Borg as a, except for the Gerardi Borg, hippie Borg. But the bad Borg are gone. They're over. It's done. Certainly feels that way. Yeah. That was your intention. Like, I'm, you know, I'm, someone could bring him back. But you were saying. This was the last generation of that Borg. Yeah. Her, her last desperate attempt. Before the season ever started, this was all like, this is kind of the Star Trek six. So the Borg are kind of like the Klingons in that context with Kirk making peace with the Klingons. And there is an element here. This might sound like a criticism, but, um, you know, cause Picard was against the genocide against the Borg, right? Which he had the opportunity to, to do what essentially Janeway did and he didn't take it. You know, was there any issue of like a diplomatic solution with the Borg or another way to end the Borg that wasn't them just dying, all dying? 
because Picard's Mister. You know, that's that's more his style, as it were. You mean at the end of this finale? Yeah, like like uh, to, to to end the Borg. Was there another way? Was there a more? Did you consider the moral implications? I guess because Picard Picard certainly did. Well, um, I don't I don't know that the queen really gave them an opportunity to consider the moral <laughs> implications <laughs> of they had cons- basically had taken over all of all of um starfleet and um assimilated his son so she didn't really give them she a, a chance to talk it out she was saying things like we're going to procreate and then annihilate so that it didn't really feel like it was hey Maybe we can live in peace. A uh, situation uh, with this particular board queen. Um, that was my impression. Okay. <laughs> I, I guess you, the, is it. Do you feel like that was that was going to be the? Well, before I mean, we didn't know the. I'm saying, you know, obviously she had to go because she was horrible. Um, but <laughs> you know, the the, the it, that was the scenario that was created for her. I guess the question is. Has Picard changed? He's kind of his strong moral stance is such a key part of him. And I guess, you know, is that is he still that same person? Is, is he still against genocide or is he also uh, changed? I, I think, of course, he, he is. I, I absolutely think he is against genocide. I think in this case, there wasn't really an opportunity to debate this. I think they had to, the Borg Queen had built her cube in a way that her amplifier was built into the substructure of her own ship. So she was sort of the architect of her own destruction and in, in that way. So he didn't order the, the end of the Borg. She sort of, it's kind of her fault. Well, Beverly did fire the, um, it's right. really Beverly. Say, Picard wasn't even the one who made the decision on that. He was very busy. Right. right. I don't know if, I think they had that, you know, 30 second decision, which is like, if we don't fire now, the galaxy is going to be assimilated. Well, I mean, I guess this, it, it also comes to the sympathy for the changelings. And it's almost like it was all basically, we're just going to beat up the bad guys. There was, you know, was there any possibility to make peace with these, you know, changelings that were aggrieved as it were? I think certainly with the changelings, you have a, uh, if you, if you were to see the rest of that year, I think you have an absolute Star Trek uh, trial that's interesting of of Vadix people, um, of that conspiracy, of those changelings. I think you have um, the Great Link to deal with. I think there's a really interesting... You also have a really interesting um, story to tell about. You now have a post frontier day starfleet yeah where you have every single young starfleet member was once assimilated it's sort of like a post snap marvel universe um these these kids have a connection now that no other starfleet generation has ever had um i think there's something really interesting to explore there um seven would be less lonely yeah, well, I mean, I think they all have a certain <laughs> point of view um, uh, uh, of that. I think that's really an interesting sociological uh, way of, of looking at things as well. I mean, you know, I think, you know, we had talked about how they might view Jack, too, as, w- as well as so they were all connected to Jack, that there's a certain level of forgiveness they have for him because they were directly connected to him. Um, so, uh, but I, I digress. Um <laughs> Yes, I do. I do think that there is a a point of view of the changelings uh, that you would explore in future stories if you were lucky to tell them. Are we supposed to take away that everyone, roughly everyone over the age of 25 in Starfleet during those hours was killed? No, I think there was plenty of people like who resisted and were managed to. But no. like what percent survived? Less than 50? I don't, I don't. <laughs> a lot of people died. Is I, I, I think there were certainly casualties. Like I'm not, I'm not going to see her arbitrate the casualty rate of Frontier Day. Oh. Do it. Well, it would be a big part of. I mean, if let you know, if Starfleet essentially became 
every, you know, almost devoid of people middle-aged and older, you know, that would be a big part of legacy. It would be a strange situation. They'd have to recruit new people. And, you know, it, it I, I just thought you might. I think have- it's certainly a part. I, I, I do think that you had on all those ships, rebellions going on, hiding and seeking, you know, I, even space dock doesn't explode. It's just, it's debilitated. Um, but there are heavy casualties, I think. <laughs> It's um, good to know there's consequences. Yes. Yeah. I would think there'd be a very different era going yes, forward after there is a Frontier Day Memorial in San Francisco, without question. Right. I just kept thinking about the connection between the Borg and the Changeling. So again, ask I'm asking you head canning questions again because I love the thought behind all of this. But did you have a vision of sort of how the Borg and the Changelings ended up becoming, you know, co conspirators? Um, you mean how they got how they got together? Yeah, yeah. Um, we might do it as a as a limited series, so I can't talk too much about it. But yes, including um, how they got the Shrike, including that communications device in which Vatic talks to the Borg Queen. Yeah, we have a whole backstory on that. Originally, you were going to see that other the other side of that communication device on the Borg cube. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the the other the other the other side of that thing but um couldn't do it for production reasons because that was always one of the big questions of what is the shrike is it a just a dominion ship or is it something a one off or you know uh, you have an answer to that it sounds like we have an answer to it yeah when you say limited series you mean comic book or you mean limited uh, series comic book no not a limited a comic comic series yeah is this going to come after the series about odo's bucket it's gonna no. This is like a actually a real one. <laughs> this is a real one that we've that there's a there's a thing for. Oh, really? Here's a pitch for yeah. Well, but I think this season actually, when thinking about the extended universe of books and comic books, there's all sorts of things um, that you know. So without official things, what are thing areas you'd like to see explored in the extended universe? Besides Odo's bucket, <laughs> I think there's quite a, f- uh, a few things. I think there's certainly Beverly Crusher out there on the frontier, um, and her doctor, Doctors of that Border story with her early Jack Crusher. Um, I think there's a lot of really interesting stuff there. Um, I really love the crime stories, the Valashi crime syndicate. I think is really cool with Sneed and and uh, and Crin and um, Brunt. Yes, yes. <laughs> Even more. Even yeah, Morn got involved in the action. He got involved then. too. Um, I think Vanek and the, uh, Vanek and her her changeling uprising is is a really interesting tale uh, for sure. I think uh, the story of the Borg dying out in the Delta Quadrant and um, hearing Jack's voice across the universe as he's coming into. Uh, uh, coming of age is is really cool. Worf, his evolution is 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 fascinating. I mean, there's the the LaForge family. There's so much. Let's do some ra- rapid fire. Yeah. Where are they? What's going on with these characters? So is Picard at the end? So Beverly's now an admiral. Is is Picard active or retired again? He was always retired, and is he still retired? I like to think that. Picard still is playing a part in some level in some Starfleet operations in some way. I I, I like to think that perhaps he's gotten enough. He's gotten the right level of criticism of his wine (laughs) Um, and knowing that his, his kid is out there um, on an enterprise that, that there's, there's some part of him that's still called to the stars, but that's just me as, um, as Terram Talos. Well, it makes sense in a way if they've wiped out a lot of the older people too, that there would be some vacuums there that he could fill. Um, I have an easier one for you. Where's okay. Kestra? <laughs> Kestra, we we um, probably wish that line made it in because uh, uh, was is it just we, there was I forget why it did not make it in. There was some reason. Um, was early admissions in Starfleet Academy. Oh. Huh? And so she was not at the house when the changeling show, showed up. But was she assimilated? 
Well, if she would is if she had not gone through a transporter, she probably would have been all okay. So uh, if uh, if the changelings had only infiltrated starships in certain areas, she um, as long as she hadn't gone through one of those, she might be all right. Here's a, I asked this question of Brent Spiner, but it's the same thing of philosophically is data data. This is almost like a memory alpha question of is he so. him? Yes. So this is a, he is as much data as Spock is Spock after Star Trek Four. I would absolutely say that's correct, and more so. I think more so with more, even more understanding because he's he's got his brother. He's got soon as uh, 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 got soon in there. He's got a little bit of lol. Um, he's got B four. I think he has even more of an understanding of who he was and what makes him what makes him him and his family up so yes i would say he's even more so data he's he's sp truly spock in a lot of ways post in the way that spock had an almost more human quality after four so what how does starfleet view him because starfleet just accepted spock back as captain spock picard referenced data as commander in the final episode. So is he, is he was a commander as a nemesis. So is he just, right. does he have Starfleet back pay if they had money? Is he back uh, in Starfleet? That's a good question. Uh, it, it's certainly, I, we had a thing we talked about with um, Brent and Patrick is that they would refer to each other by their old rank. That data would always call him captain. Cause he doesn't, doesn't to him. He will always be captain. Uh, he would never refer to him as Admiral because that's where he left off. That's where his last memory was. So that's why in nine he's a captain and he just stays in captain. Um, and that um, the the sort of field commission of commander is something that Picard would 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 view Data as. But it does feel like in the post in the sort of reconstruction post frontier day uh, that Data would be vital in that and that he would get some rank again. It would probably feel like commander. Or captain. Or captain, but probably pick first, start off where he left off. Make sure there's no glitches in this, yeah. <laughs> in this new robot. We've we've had some issues in the past. Excellent. All right. How about so I um where is Alexander and has Worf at all learned to be a better father? <laughs> I we have ideas, big ones, and I so I don't want to comment on that one. So let's bring up the the elephant in the room. You know, how do you feel about fans and their their the hashtag and the petition and the whole thing of we want Star Trek Legacy? Like, is this are you is this what you wanted or are you surprised? How do you feel about all of? Oh, that? I think it's super flat. I think the petition, you know, petitions. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I don't know that do those things. I mean, you would know more about petitions than me about if those things are relevant or not um it's flattering it's flattering uh i always I, I don't know i don't really know i i laugh when i see it. It, it 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 not in a mocking way it's sort of like it's kind of funny <laughs> i don't know like when I, when you see those things um uh, certainly a lot of people have signed it and it, it's flattering and i i i yes of course uh, this i would love to do another tv series based on this it certainly it was a uh, it feels natural to go there. I don't know that it, it ever happens. Um, but it um uh it is wonderful that it has inspired people to uh, the fan art's beautiful. I love that. There's one guy who cut like this little teaser using these quotes from Kirk and Jane Way and Seven and then ends with uh Jack and he he's a uh, piece from star trek five jerry goldsmith scored it's it just gives it gives me chills and i'm like i want to make that show so bad so that's that's wonderful um that probably that little tiny clip inspires me the most because it makes me feel like i you know there is a star trek the next generation show to be made still and i would love to do that so I have friends who are very casual stuff. They don't read Trek movie. Weird that they don't, but they don't read Trek movie. They're not reading all the stuff. They just watch the show. And when they watch the show, they were like, oh, so there's the next one coming because of how it ended. I mean, it's such a clear setup. Like, did you get pushback on filming that or 
concerns about that? It, it no, seemed to very all. much imply a spinoff. Not at all. No, because it it wasn't designed to be spinoff. It's designed to pass the torch. I mean, the, it, like it it should feel like the beginning. Like you wouldn't want to end it feeling like a funeral. You want it to end feeling positive that these heroes continue, that their children will go out into the universe and explore strange new worlds. So that Seven is going to get her due and that Rafi is going to be by her side and that Jack is going to go out there uh, and with the LaForge sisters, like th- that's what you naturally want the ending to be. So no, it never was, that was never a, a bone of contention with anyone. It was just designed to be the ending should feel like a beginning. Even the scene with Q and Jack? That was because the very first, it was a nod to encounter Farpoint. You know, Q showing up to Picard and saying humanity's trial is beginning, coming to Jack and saying the same thing. It was an idea that uh, John Delancey and I had uh, back in season two. And uh, yes, it certainly gives you the chills of, oh, this could go on. Sure, absolutely. It gives you the feeling of, yes, let's have a spinoff. You mentioned that you were recording stuff for the DVD. Yeah, we had already recorded pre-strike the DVD commentaries. Yeah. Is there anything special coming on that, on the home video release? Yeah, it's going to be packed with a lot of great stuff. We made sure it's going to be really special for fans. Lots of behind the scenes stuff. Lots of commentary. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful set. I know the strike just started, but uh, you know, what's your status? You're you you've, you said you're no longer working for Star Trek. What are you working on? And what you know, what what's your future looking like for the next year? You think? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, I uh, you know, I'm in development on a on a on a few things, and that's it right now. I I have no um, uh, active show right now. I'm a man without a country um, out there. Uh, you know, right now I, I do work for CBS Paramount. I'm on a deal. So, uh, so I develop for them currently, but we're on strike at the moment for the, with the WGA. And um, that is it. <laughs> That's all there is. Uh, Terry, thank you so much. We still have like f- 500 more questions to ask you, but I assume you have things to do. Well, so. I'll, I'll have to come back and hear the, the remaining 500. Yeah. <laughs> and and again, like that was whatever along the way I go this, this, I nitpick this and that. It was a magnificent season. And I think it gave us all, most of us, something we just desperately wanted. And thank you. Well, I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching it. Thank you for being here. And also, you know, I, I'll say the same thing. You did what you set out to do, which was you said you were going to give them a proper send off. And you did. And it's it, it, even more so than I thought possible. So well done. Same. Thank you. Thank you. I, that means a lot to me. Thank you, guys. It's for you. <laughs> It felt that, honestly, there were moments where it totally felt that it was personally for me. (laughs) That's great. I'm glad. As always, Mr. Metallus has given us great bounty. He's he's so great to talk to. Like, he really will get into the the weeds with us, which I appreciate. Yeah, I've always enjoyed talking to Terry because he is one of us, as it were. Yeah. Even though not any one of us could do what he just did no Um, (laughs) (laughs) i wish i could (laughs) but still you know he speaks our language as it were and that's great so and hopefully we do get him back you know because i was kind of thinking as we were wrapping up like is this going to be the last time we ever have terry no you know we will have to have him back for sure yeah i think we should for sure so to make room for that interview we are not doing bits this week Um, And I know we took a break, an unscheduled surprise break last week, but we will be back next week. We, it might be an interview. It might not. We don't know yet. It'll be a surprise for you. And I think at this point, it's still a surprise (laughs) for us, but we'll figure it out. (laughs) But we'll be back. And thank you for listening. See ya.